Thank you. So, <laughs> I'm white. <laughs> and I live in a world where I benefit from white privilege. And if you're white, you benefit from white privilege as well. But if you identify as a woman, you also live in a world where you're oppressed. And there's a strange dichotomy in being both oppressed and the oppressor. Okay, I know that's a little rough start there, but I feel like this slide might be a little disingenuous. But I, I think we spend, as humans, we spend an inordinate amount of time and energy trying to avoid discomfort in all of its forms. But discomfort has so much to teach us. It holds within it growth, understanding, adaptability, empathy, resilience. Discomfort is powerful. Take for an example an experience I had in a grocery store. I'm standing in line, waiting to check out. The cashier is like a young black woman, probably 16. The, woman, the white woman in front of me has like a ton of produce, and um, the cashier is doing her best to remember all the produce codes, but she's new, it's taken a long time. The woman in front of me is getting impatient. You know how I know? She starts to do that like exaggerated sigh thing. You know it, like, <sighs> and when that doesn't somehow magically make this young cashier move faster, she levels up and she starts like shifting her weight while she sighs. And I'm standing there thinking like, all right, lady, relax, she's new, but I don't say anything. Then the cashier holds up a vegetable and she asks, can you tell me what this is called? My heart drops because I know exactly what's going to happen. I'm in, in my head and I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to intervene, but I'm too slow and she starts. It's a leek. How do you not know what a leek is? Doesn't your mother feed you vegetables? <laughs> and it's slow motion. My mouth opens and I have no idea what's going to come out. <laughs> and just in that moment, she turns to me, to me, and she says, can you believe this? She doesn't know what a leak is. I look around trying to figure out who the hell she's talking to because it <laughs> can't be me. And I realize in that moment that she sees me, a similarly aged white woman buying produce in a grocery store, and she sees an ally. And I'm pissed. And I have no idea what I'm going to say, but the best I can come up with in the moment is, what is up with your feminism? You are being such a shitty human right now, and you're ruining leaks for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Admittedly, not my best work. <laughs> but that moment happened over 20 years ago, and I remember it like it was yesterday, because it was such a transformative moment for me, and it changed everything I thought I knew about feminism and allyship. Unlearning the problematic thinking that we've been taught as a result of living both with white privilege and without gender equality is, I would argue, the single biggest contribution that we can make to the resistance. We all carry around things that we need to unlearn as a result of our upbringing. The blinders have to come off, and it's going to suck at first. At first, all you can see is everything that's wrong and all the injustice and everything you were taught not to see. And suddenly the racist and classist undertones of an impatient woman in a grocery store are blindingly visible. It's a painful process, but the only way to change it is to see it and see how we fit into it. If you look at the history of women's liberation movements in the US, you're going to see a long history of white supremacy. White women have not just excluded women of color and queer women from liberation movements, they have actively worked to oppress them in their quest for straight white liberation and access, from the suffrage movement to the civil rights movement. It's natural to feel passionately about confronting your own oppression because it's comfortable. You see it, you live it, you experience it, you're an authority on your lived experience. But it's deeply uncomfortable to confront our role as oppressors or the beneficiaries of oppressive systems. Side note, I would argue this is why so many men have trouble calling themselves feminists. Things are great in the white feminist world when we're talking about our shared oppression as women, but things tend to go south when other oppressions are brought up. 
And that, my friends, is white feminist thinking, and it's problematic. 52% of white women voted for Trump, the man who prior to the election bragged about sexually assaulting women. 52% of white women voted for a sexual predator over a wildly qualified woman. That is some uncomfortable shit right there. The patriarchy has trained us well. After the election, I went to the Women's March in Chicago, and my hope was restored. <laughs> right? That was a good one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was inspired. I was heartened to see a tidal wave of resistance by women. And then the rise of Me Too, and I thought, oh my god, this is it, the fall of the patriarchy. I believe that this is our moment, that this is the moment when feminism will triumph, but it has to look and feel different than it has in the past, and that requires that white feminists get comfortable being uncomfortable. So where do we start? Clearly, I think the first step is just embracing discomfort as both an indicator and a tool. So if you start to have feelings of being challenged or angry, shame, guilt, stop. Listen to your body and try to identify where those feelings are coming from and get curious about them, but don't judge them. And as you start to figure out what's triggering you, dive deep into those topic areas. Read, take a class, work with other feminists who live comfortably in those topic areas and ask questions. Make it a point to consider how women with different backgrounds might experience an issue differently than you. For example, uh, equal pay. We always seem to point to the statistic that women make 80 cents to every dollar a man makes. But what's missing from that statistic is the word white. White women make 80 cents to every dollar a white man makes. Black women, for instance, make 60 cents to every dollar a white man makes. Next up, pay particular attention to your airtime. The patriarchy teaches us that we shouldn't take up space. So naturally, challenging that looks like taking up space, leading, challenging, voicing our opinions. But white supremacy teaches us that white opinions are the most valid and the ones that should be heard. And so we're back to that oppressed, oppressor dichotomy again. I'm certain, I'm going to assume, that every woman in this room has been mansplained at some point in their life. So you know the experience of having your voice silenced or your perspective invalidated, your ideas reappropriated. Just apply that same awareness to feminist spaces. Akin to that is showing up. Do you only show up in spaces created for white women? Have you been to a Black Lives Matter march? Pride Parade, called a legislator about immigration policy. I hear a lot of white women say that they're uncomfortable showing up in spaces not created for white women because they're uncomfortable, they don't feel welcome, they're not sure how to be an ally in those moments. But the good news is, the more that you work to unlearn problematic thinking and get informed, the more you're going to want to show up in spaces you've never shown up in before. The easier it will be to know when to move forward and to move back and the more comfortable you're going to feel as a visible and present ally. Lastly, let's talk about intervening. It can be uncomfortable, if not downright scary, to intervene in moments where you see problematic or threatening language or behavior. It requires bravery, but bravery requires preparation and practice. Now, when I left that grocery store, I spent weeks thinking about how I wish I had handled it differently so that I could have been a better ally to that cashier or educated versus shamed that woman in front of me, an approach that didn't involve screaming about leaks. <laughs> a friend of mine said, why don't you write down all the ways you wish you had handled it? So I did. Then I started practicing it. And the next time I was in a situation where I needed to be an active bystander, I handled it way more effectively. I had more confidence, and I was able to come at the situation differently because I had prepared and practiced. <laughs> so as we all start to unlearn our problematic thinking and embrace our discomfort, we're going to uncover limitless ways to work towards a just society.
this is a time of discomfort. You need to just dive in. You're not gonna do it right. It's not always gonna be graceful. You're gonna take shit for it. But the faster and the more important part is that we're embracing our discomfort and we're challenging it head on. Because you're either working towards a just society or you're benefiting from an unjust one. Thank you.